Time now for the press preview, the first look at the front pages. Uh, tonight, in the next half an hour, we'll be taking a look at what's making the headlines uh, with this pair. The Financial Times Whitehall editor, Sebastian Payne, and the senior editor at The Economist, Anne McElvoy. Uh, guys, lovely to have you on the programme this evening. And guess what? Plenty to talk about. I, I, I suppose we shall start... After we've had a look at the paper stack, thank you for reminding me, guys, the debt with the Daily Telegraph carrying accusations from Downing Street sources. The Boris Johnson's former chief advisor, Dominic Cummings, leaked private texts from the Prime Minister concerning lobbying to the media. Uh, let's have a look at the FT. They have word uh, that the former PM, David Cameron, lobbied the top civil servant at the Treasury and indeed the deputy governor at the Bank of England on behalf of Greensill Capital. At The Guardian, well, it's choosing to take the angle that uh, Mr Cameron asked the Bank of England and the Treasury to risk up to £20 billion in taxpayer cash to help Greensill Capital at the start of the global pandemic. Uh, same story in the eye. It says new emails have surfaced uh, showing that Mr Cameron chased the top officials to help his client. Uh, the Metro, uh, choosing a different story, leading with the US President Joe Biden calling on fellow world leaders to do their part to tackle climate change. He pledged to have America's greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. The Mail, meanwhile, juxtaposing a 1,000 fans being allowed into the World Snooker Finals as part of a trial in COVID safety. Well, they're contrasting that with the fact that there is still a 30-person limit on attendance at funerals has the feel that that might uh, be changing sometime soon. Uh, as we said, uh, joined tonight by Sebastian and Anne. And good to see you guys. And we can crack on with the stories. And, and, and Anne, to you first. Um, a story, in fact, which I think is going to eventually end up appearing in pretty much all the papers, first editions perhaps of The Sun, which we don't have just yet. But The Daily Telegraph, oh, it seems we might have a name uh, for the man responsible or the person responsible for leaking the texts. Yes, indeed. And that's, of course, Dominic Cummings, uh, who left number 10 after a big uh, bust up with the prime minister and with others on the team there. That was before Christmas. This has been around, I would say, in shouts and murmurs in Westminster for some time. The allegation, and it is still only an allegation, that Dominic Cummings leaked private texts from the Prime Minister to which he had access. And that, so say, allies of the Prime Minister, and there is a, a senior official there, number 10, quoted in the piece, that explains why we've had something of a, a flurry of embarrassing stories about Boris Johnson's texts, uh, whether it be with James Dyson uh, over lobbying for his company as a, in terms of uh, tax treatment, if he were to help on providing ventilators in the pandemic, or on other associations of Boris Johnson, including with Mohammed Bill Sam in Saudi Arabia. These were clearly not things the Prime Minister particularly wanted to come out or to come out in that way. And the surmise in the Telegraph's piece and elsewhere is that this is a grudge match. It's basically a revenge you talk about in opera, the gutter damerong. Well, this would be, I suppose, be the gutter domerong. Uh, but it's either way, it's the final flourish of Dominic Cummings' revenge. Um, Sebastian, of course, clearly, allegations of corruption, allegations of cronyism, you know, this is bread and butter to political journalists, and, and rightly so, but, but the source of the leaks, I mean, is, is that going to be raising any eyebrows outside of SW1, or is it, as, as my colleague John Craig likes to say, one for the aficionados? I think it's a bit of both now. And like the fact is, obviously, the stuff that's made its way into the public domain is very embarrassing for Boris Johnson. You know, those texts with Mohammed bin Salman, the texts with James Dyson. This is not the sort of way we see government operating in this country, people sending WhatsApp messages to do things that would normally go through official channels. Um, obviously, there's been a stream of this stuff. There's been several leak inquiries. I've actually lost count of who's doing what at the moment. But clearly, people inside number 10 and this story appears in several newspapers i think it's in the times and in the sun as well suggests that senior people near to boris johnson are a bit fed up with all this stuff getting into the public domain and have decided that they think mr cummings is the suspect we should point out mr cummings hasn't responded to this there's no comment from him on this now but i think it will raise eyebrows and dominic cummings does have a profile beyond westminster as well people who've seen the brexit movie will know him as the chief strategist behind the leave campaign 
campaign and he developed sort of infamy during the time that he was inside there. But there is a lot of acrimony still about his departure. And if Mr Cummings is guilty of leaking these text messages, as is being alleged, then you can imagine there will be another salvo from him if in the coming days. So I think this war has really just intensified. And if it's been damaging for the Prime Minister so far, then there may well be more to come. Um, and take us to the, to the front of the FT and, uh, and their story, of course. I mean, uh, as Sebastian was saying, look, there are a number of probes that the FT identifies eight of them in, in their leading article. But what we've learned as the day has gone on is, is the, the efforts, the scale of the effort that David Cameron went to in, in reaching out and contacting not just ministers, uh, you know, but some very significant and senior public officials. I think it's the intensity of the lobbying, isn't it? It's clear that Mr Cameron was certainly trying to do a job that would make him good value uh, for Greensill and for that company and that he was entitled to make his living after he was Prime Minister. You can argue about whether the rules are sensibly drawn up for that sort of thing. But I think where you get to a judgment question in the uh, FT story today is, is right on this point, is the insistent lobbying of Treasury officials. I think I'm out of this quite well, reading into the FT story, is that uh, they seem to kind of hold him off, really. They block him and they have that nice civil service way of saying his former Prime Minister is in, in, has some advisory role, <laughs> slightly dismissively. But this advisory role clearly meant that he was tapping up very insistently officials who'd worked for him directly. And I think the manner of doing that, and particularly the way the story has spread also to the Bank of England, who will not be happy about this at all. Of course, people will use their contacts, and we shouldn't be unrealistic about this. People do use their contacts, and these days they tend to reach out through texts or through WhatsApp. They're not going to send a handwritten letter or carry a pigeon. But it is the scale at which David Cameron was doing it, and it could be seen as putting some degree of moral pressure on people who worked for him as Prime Minister. That's going to be very awkward for him. I mean, uh, Sebastian, I heard, I heard one Cabinet Minister, I think it was quasi Quartem, but I, I, I will check that, but you're know, saying on, on, on television today, look, it's entirely to be expected. You know, in fact, it is a good thing that people can have direct access to senior ministers and, uh, and prime ministers. But I suppose the, the problem with that is that we don't all have that access, that no one enjoys uh, the access uh, that certain individuals do, depending, of course, on, on the administration and indeed the prime minister. Well, to use a phrase, to appoint Lord Copper with that, that yes, it is right that people in the private sector should have access to ministers, and it's not healthy for government to have business and the civil service operating in a hermetically sealed bubble, as often has happened in the past there. But Anne is exactly right. This lobbying was going on at the absolute peak of the coronavirus crisis, where ministers like Rishi Sunak and Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor, were trying to keep the whole British economy on the road at this point. And they came up with these schemes to get money out to small and medium-sized businesses as soon as possible. That was a very complex task. And, you know, the, the economic turmoil of the past years, unlike anything that we've seen in decades, if not longer than that, in Britain's modern history. And I think that's the thing that really surprised me about these communications. The Treasury made it quite clear early on the Greensill capital was not going to be allowed into these schemes. And yet Mr Cameron and Mr Greensill, according to these communiques, kept on communicating and pushing to different ministers and different officials trying to make the case for their products. That's fine. That, you know, Mr Cameron's no longer in politics. He's got a job in the private sector. He can do that. But I think there is just that question of, was it a sensible and wise thing to do? And also, David Cameron must have known the pressure he was putting on these individuals. You know, John Glenn, who's the Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury, who was in these, these papers released today. He's been a big role of trying to get these schemes working there. And I'm sure he didn't appreciate, shall we say, that extra pressure from David Cameron. And there's one of the officials who actually said, we've got incoming from our old boss here, which I think gives you a bit of a hint of the atmosphere inside the Treasury at having to deal with Mr Cameron's requests. Well, and just as we as we showed the, the, our, our viewers, the, kind of the lead article in the, the Guardian, again, talking about David Cameron pushing, pushing the Bank of England and all of this. I mean, this is where the point that both of you were making and agreeing with it, that, that Sebastian was making and you were nodding in agreement. I, I just David Cameron has worked in the back room of politics. He's worked in the front room of politics. He's been prime minister. Did he not expect that at some point some of this detail might make its way into the public domain, including that figure on the front of The Guardian? £20 billion we're talking about. Well, I suppose he 
could simply have calculated that Greensill Capital wouldn't go so spectacularly bust, which is the <laughs> reason that so much of this has, has come out. Uh, uh, politicians in their afterlife make calculations, don't they, about who they, they think they should work for. It was a spectacular miscalculation. Of course, others were also wrong about Greensill Capital. That's uh, certainly the case. It's not only David Cameron who's been caught out on, on that one. So I don't know that he would have thought they would come out. And also remember, if Greensill had been prospering and if its products had been doing well, well, you could say he would have said, well, you see, this goes to show I was actually lobbying something which I really believe in. I did choose to go and work for this company because I believe in its products. It's the fact that when it all goes wrong, and this is the story of the link between bankruptcies, finance and politics, back to the novels of Anthony Trollope, it's all there in the, the 19th century of bubbles and busts. You're caught on the wrong side of them. Then everything comes out in the least flattering light. I think personally that the decision to extend that lobbying to the Bank of England in terms of that kind of bailout money, that really for me does take it to another dimension. I think the Treasury is well capable of looking after itself as it, it showed. It was an irritation. He crossed the line, but uh, I, I, I'm not that surprised by it. I think it just is a bit more of a misjudgment to get involved with the Bank of England. And that is really where you're putting yourself, I think, in a very vulnerable position in terms of your own judgment. And also these are people who know how to fight back and they are going to say no and uh, you know, they really don't mind it coming out afterwards. So I think on all scores, it's been a bit of a pratfall, hasn't it? Uh, you might say that. I couldn't possibly comment. Sorry, Seb, you were saying? Just briefly, please. Yes, I was just going to pop in there and say, I think what happened here, David Cameron made a bet with Greensill Capital. And don't forget that this banker was very closely tied into Whitehall. He was brought into the civil service by Lord Hayward, the former head of the civil service. And so you can understand why Mr. Cameron would have thought this was a good and sure way to earn a living once he'd finished leaving government here. But, you know, I've spoken to ministers who work closely with David Cameron while he was in government, and they acknowledge that simply he just made a very bad call because many former prime ministers like John Major or Gordon Brown, they do much more low-key things, a couple of speeches here, a book there, a turn on Sky News on the Sunday morning programmes. They don't do these big grand things that are high risk and high reward. Um, and I think really it must say something about Mr Cameron's character yep. that he left government, he left parliament and he decided to make this risk. And when you look at those emails today, it actually feels a mm. little bit desperate desperate in some respects that Cameron was continuing to push these emails and push green sales products on the civil service because it was made quite clear early on that Rishi Sunak was not willing to engage with them. And as Anne said, you know, you've spoken to the Treasury. They said no. You then go to the Bank of England and try and reach the governor. He also says no. And at some point, obviously, you have to realise that it's just not going to happen. I think he maybe just went a little bit too far there. Uh, Seb, Anne, pause right there. We'll talk about that topic, I'm sure, again next time. Uh, but after the break, uh, it may not seem like it, but apparently Britain is no longer in a pandemic. We'll dig into the science behind that claim when we come back. Uh, welcome back to the press preview. Sebastian and Anne still with us. Um, and let's return uh, to the front page of the, of the Telegraph, Anne, uh, and the story there. Britain no longer in a pandemic. How so? Well, this obviously depends a bit on the definition of a pandemic, but it really is a reflection of the fact that a high vaccination rate and obviously a much lower R infection rate means that Britain technically now escapes the definition of a pandemic, whereas, of course, lots of other European countries were still struggling with their R rate and their vaccination rate would still count as being in the pandemic. It doesn't mean that the behaviours that we had before the pandemic can simply spring back into life. And it doesn't mean, of course, that uh, something couldn't go wrong. But yes, we do on the most of the uh, definitions that you would apply to the numbers. Britain is out of it, at least crossed fingers, it's out of it for now. Yep, fingers, toes, everything else crossed. Um, Sebastian, everything. I do want to have a quick look at the, at the Metro front page because it's a significant announcement, one which we were expecting from President Biden, but to half uh, US greenhouse gases by, by, by 2030. The question, as always, isn't it, is whether or not anyone else is going to do the same. If you don't have the rest of the world with you, what's the point? Sebastian, to you. I think. Anne, we'll talk to you instead. Why don't you have a go? 
<laughs> yes. um, I'm sure he'll rematerialize. Yeah, indeed. I mean, but the, the interesting thing, President Biden has really set out this is his first major international summit as the new president. He clearly wants to see himself as being the presidency well, is going to, to tackle climate change. Looks like you've got Sir Sebastian back as well. <laughs> Do you know what? We've got 20 seconds, Sebastian. So tell us just how excited you are about President Biden. No. No, I, I know, I recognise that blank stare, and I recognise that blank stare. And just you finish us off. I was only going to say, yes, it's obviously only not even half the battle, but when America gives that kind of lead, I think the assumption is that a lot of Western countries will fall in behind it. You can see that happening in Britain on the road to the, the COP26 uh, climate summit. It's also, I think, really intended to be an offer to China and to Russia and to other countries who maybe not haven't been so bothered about their international sure. reputation to, to match this. And that's really the diplomatic game.